and welcome to TV Toastmasters. I'm your host. My name is Deb Hart. I'm the founder of PinkSistas.org. I have a special guest I'd like to share with you tonight. Her name is Carol Guest. Welcome, Thank Carol. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming and joining us yes. today. Yes. So tell the viewers Who's Carol? Who's Carol? Carol is a mom. And what else is there about me? Um, I live in Vancouver. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Not just that, but that's part of me. Right now, it's the biggest part, I think. So tell us about being diagnosed with breast cancer. How long ago was that? My first diagnosis was 2002. And then uh, it came back as stage four in 2008. So I've been on chemo since 2008. Wow. Yeah, it's a long time, but I'm surviving. I'm yes. still here. And you have a fabulous doctor. Yes, Dr. John Smith at okay. Compass Oncology. Fabulous, amazing. Okay. Yeah, all my faith is in him. What's the impact of this diagnosis been with your family? Oh, it's been very hard. It's, I think, very hard for me, knowing that um, perhaps I couldn't see them grow up. Yeah. Yeah, but my youngest turned um, 18, and I celebrated it for many different reasons. And one of them is that I just survived because she was two when I was diagnosed, wow. first diagnosed. So those first couple of years, you wonder if you're gonna be here. And then I was free and clear for six years, and then it came back, but I've still survived, I'm still here. Wow. Believe it or not, yeah. I believe it. <laughs> when I met you at the retreat, <clears throat> Carol works at Fred Meyer, and Fred Meyer did a retreat this year with Pink Sistas, and amazing. we partnered, and it was amazing. That Can was you share amazing. a little bit about that experience at yes. the retreat? Yes, so it was uh, eight women and Deb, the mom, who brought us all together, and various stages of cancers and diagnosis. Some, one lady was newly diagnosed, and her journey was a little heart-wrenching, and I think I'm the longest survivor so on the other end you know I w when I was first diagnosed I always looked to that person who survived the longest so I was hoping to be that for a friend and she works at the same Fred Meyer as I do so she's just starting her journey and hopefully I'm not ending my journey I'm you, continuing <laughs> you are continuing, <laughs> continuing in a big way Carol. yes you are full of life and <clears throat> you were such an inspiration for our retreat. Oh, I'm glad I came. And be. you know, we had a lot of fun that weekend. It was amazing. It was I was a little full. little reluctant because I didn't know people going in. Yes. And um, then I found out Elaine, my friend, was coming, and I thought, you know, if nothing else, I can be there for her if she needs me. And but when I got here, it was. Uh, or when I got to the retreat, it was so much more than that. It was like I relaxed. And I mean, we came to the retreat and we all met and we all just took a deep breath. And then we all shared parts of our story between all the action. And it was just an amazing experience. Between all the kayaking and all the paddleboarding and the boat excursion and yes. the jewelry making. And the jewelry and making, the yes. yoga. The yeah. yoga, I think, was part of my favorite part, but I think the uh, paddleboarding, I paddleboarded. Yes. I was pretty excited to try. And I actually got up and I stayed up until I fell. <laughs> 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 but, it, you know, the the teacher was afraid that uh, of me falling and i was like no no I, I wanted to fall because now i know that i can fall and get right back up so yeah. it was yeah it was she was afraid that i would be scared of it then but i was like no 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 
I'm good. A couple of Pieces' goals is always to unite women with the common denominator of breast cancer and truly watch it become a strong bond at yes. the end of the weekend. Yes. And your group was one of the strongest bonds that we've had thus far this year. I believe it. There's and a lot of And with one women. of the girls who was just starting on her journey, uh, just last week we all got together again and went out on the boat mm -hmm. and gave her good send-off yes. and we will be there for her. And it's just a sisterhood like, you know, I just, if I, you I love. have to be part of a club, yep. that's the one to be part of. Yes. And your so. organization, Pink Sisters, supports what is hard to support. I mean, I think people often don't know what to do. Right. And to have an organization like yours that will support knowing what we are going through and yeah. will start going through is uh, that meant the world to me because it, it let us think without worrying about having to cook dinner. <laughs> it yes. let us rest. Yes. And it was quiet and action packed at the same time. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you. It was. I meet amazing women, and I always say the same thing. I fall in love with another group every time they come to the retreat house. And I think I would, too. It, yeah. yeah, it's just hard not to, you know, to send them on their way, on their journey, and not, you know, become close. Mm -hmm. and so, <clears throat> so can you share with us uh, some of the struggles that you've had on the journey that you've been on, hmm. Carol? You know, just There's one one jer one struggle. Well, I think there's quite a few. Let me okay. see if I can. <laughs> okay. There, are, I do have funny stories. I think humor is what gets me through the struggles. Good. So there are struggles, and it's just sometimes my treatment was weekly, and that was horrible. Yeah. But sick all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And just you know you don't have any hair and all those things that go with chemo, but then. Um, the humor would get me through because I've had some really funny moments with my family. Just, you know, lay on the floor laughing. And, and at first they were kind of surprised that I could laugh about it, but I think that's what gets me through the most. Well, so, you mentioned earlier when we were chatting, cookie fit? A cookie fit? What oh, was the, that? The cookie fairies. Oh, cookie fairies. The cookie fairies. <laughs> okay, when I was having treatment, I had it every two weeks in the beginning. And I had it on Thursday so I could recover Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then I could go back to work on Monday and the kids would be in school on Monday. So they were two, nine, and 11 when I was diagnosed. <sighs> and so it was, but that's why, that's why I could get up every morning because my two-year-old needed me. I think without the kids, I wouldn't perhaps survived or thrived. But the, back to the cookie fairies. Every Thursday when I'd go for treatment, I'd come home and there'd be a little plate of cookies on my porch and it would be all, it would have a little glitter on it, a bow and cellophane and it was always different cookies and that meant so much to me knowing that they were, and you know, between, I'd forget that the cookie fairies were coming, but there they were on my Did you ever porch. find out who the cookie fairy is? Yes, I did. Ooh. Yes, I did from our school where the kids went. Mary Hunter was my cookie fairy. Yes. Wow. Just lovely, giving, kind family. And our daughters were in the same class, so. Nice. Yeah, that was great. Those are important parts. Yes. You know, that get us through. On Sundays, every Sunday, not just chemo Sundays, but on Sundays, I have a big family and I have many, many, many cousins. Like I think I'm 42. I'm the youngest of 42. Oh. So think of 42 weeks. 42 cousins every Sunday would bring me dinner and they would cook it and we would sit in the kitchen and they'd cook in the kitchen and the family oh. would sit at the bar and it was such a great way to connect with family oh, and no. to think of all those people that you know brought me dinner and cooked me dinner and spent time with us I, that was just amazing 
But Carol, I think there's a book in you of all the amazing experiences that you've had with this journey that you've been on. I'm mentally writing my book. Okay. So Good. I guess I better get on it, though. Yes. Yes. It doesn't take much <laughs> no. to write a book. I have a title. You do? I do. Let's hear it. It only takes five minutes to empty the dishwasher. That okay. was my least favorite thing to do in the universe. Yes. And I thought, well... I'm going to time it and really see how long it takes. Because <laughs> if I can do this every other day, you know, how long does it really take? Because it felt like it took 45 minutes. So I timed it, five minutes. So from now on, every time I empty the dishwasher, I think, well, that's only five minutes. So that's the name of my book. <laughs> I love it. Meaning very don't waste, don't think about the little things and don't waste your time on the little things. Yeah. You know, there's more than yes. more to life than emptying the dishwasher. Because yes. it only takes five minutes. So that's the title. But I, <laughs> I like it. Yes. I like it. Yes. <clears throat> well, tell us, with the journey that you've been on, do you have any goals that you've set? Yes, I was thinking about that because at first you think only about surviving. At first you think only um, about tomorrow, but you're surviving, you're not living. And so that is one of my goals is to difference. live. Nice. Survive, but live, yes. not just, yeah. And then also to read more biographies. So that's two. <laughs> yes. Do you have any other goals? Um, I'd love to just have more family time. Nice. The kid, so my daughter really... is going to college. My other daughter lives in Seattle. My son is home, but it'd nice. be nice to have us all together more yeah, often. More often. Yeah. I think all moms that I talk to always say that they yearn for the time that they have with the yes, children. Because yes. as they fly out of the nest, they have it other goes interests. Too fast. It does. And then they're their own little human beings. Yes. And, but yes. my yes. youngest is off to college, so. I'm so glad I got this far. Yeah. So. so what's left this summer for you to do in a fun, fun way? I mean, do you have something planned? Well, this weekend, I'm taking my daughter, daughter to uh, orientation. and What school? At Western Washington in oh. Bellingham, Washington. Nice. So she's going to start at the end of September. And this weekend, we're going up for her orientation. And then she comes back. On, or we stay till Sunday, and then Sunday she goes to a camp, and the camp is Camp Kesem, and it's a camp for children whose parents have cancer. And it started out maybe two or three chapters, just, you know, a couple people started it at, at colleges. And then now it has grown, and there's one in every state, sometimes two. And her camp is Univers University of Washington Camp Kesem. And she started as a camper, and now she's a counselor in training for the second year. And next year she wants to be a counselor. And she told me that that's um, the one place where she's surrounded with like-minded people. To be there, you know, you're parent has to have cancer and so all these kids some parents have passed away some are just beginning and but it's most of the counselors and the counselors in training also had a parent with cancer so everybody knows the journey everybody knows the struggles and the joy and laughter but it's that is an amazing experience for her and she did not want to go she did not want to go but That's I heard sweet. we really have to make her go so I made her go, and she came back changed. Nice. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. Thank yes. you for sharing it. Yeah. So, Carol, I just want to thank you so much for coming on to our show today and sharing your story and also sharing with the viewers um, about your experience at Pink Sista's free retreat for a weekend getaway amazing. on the Columbia River. Thank you. An amazing experience. Thank and. You. It gives you a foundation. Even though I've had this cancer for a while, it gives you a foundation to find a, a little bit of a purpose to, to know that you can help other people, but you can also be helped. So it was a
fabulous experience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for viewing our program. My guest was Carol Guest. I'm Deb Hart, your host for TV Toastmasters. I belong to the Gresham Toastmasters Club, and if you're looking for a club, come join us. We meet on Wednesdays in Gresham at 6.30 a.m. Bye-bye for now. Welcome to TV Toastmasters, Toastmasters where leaders are made. My name is Allison Bennett, and I'm part of the Sporty Speakers Toastmasters group. And I am here today to talk with Harlan Wheeler. He is a best-selling author, poet, inspirational troublemaker, as well as a warrior of inspiration. He's here to talk to us about his new book on zombies and our inner zombies. Welcome, Harlan. It's nice to meet you, Allison. My new book is called Quantum Change, A Zombie Guide to Self-Help. And this book was written for people that may have inner zombies that they need to shake off and develop better habits. I know I've had some inner zombies in my life, and you must have had inner zombies in your life. What did that look like? When I had inner zombies, you could imagine me weighing about 60 pounds more, on the couch, eating bad food, a truckload of bad habits, not getting exercise, not doing the things that I wanted to do when I was younger, and that's because I'd lost that inspiration edge and that motivation and the passion. So I had to decapitate my inner zombies to move to the next level. Well, I am, I'm wondering how, first of all, how did you get your zombie? And how did you get rid of it? Well, I, ide I identified my zombies. Obviously, when you're overweight, you know it. <laughs> Obviously, when you're not in shape, you know it. And I'm not eating healthy. Mm -hmm. And these things are all connected, by the way. So I identified them. And then I went out and found groups of different people to support the things that I needed to change. Lose weight, a group for... Uh, getting out and moving, exercising, and actually into a writing and a poet uh, class. Uh, these were all free classes, by the way. So. And a Toastmasters group, and I'm Toastmasters. sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm a member of the Sandy Toastmasters. Yes. Very great group of people. If you're anywhere up by the mountain, come join us every Tuesday at 630. <laughs> That's great yeah. plug. So I read your book and it was fantastic. One of the things I loved about it is that you you read with light or you write with funny metaphors as well as from real life experiences and you have action plans. So tell us about your real life experience that happened that got you into this predicament. Okay, well the my real life experience is is from about thirty five years of standing in front of salespeople. And that involves inspiring them, motivating them, recharging their batteries. So it just became like a part of me that I had all of this inside of me all the time, 35 years worth, and that's what came out in the book. So was there a particular event that happened that kind of woke you up or... Well, it, yeah, there was, and that's in the book. It's in the beginning of the book. There was a car accident, mm -hmm. and most self-help or motivational books don't start with a bad story, but this one did because it had to show you that I'm a real person and mm -hmm. things happen to us mm -hmm. along the way. That can take away uh, part of our life that we don't want taken away. And so I did have a bad experience, and I said, I just don't want to be in this spot anymore. I want to change. And that was the, what I called the quantum change. It wasn't over time. I identified my, the things I needed to change, and I did them. So you just made a snap decision and started new habits. I, just, I didn't even want time to think about it. I thought if I think about it, I'll back <laughs> out of it. Because you always think about, I think I'll go to the gym today. <laughs> now I think I'll go tomorrow. Don't think. Trick yourself into doing it. Yes, and you know what I heard is uh, somebody said to do a two-minute thing. Just think about the next two minutes. Get up off the couch and get on your way to the gym. Yeah. And then keep thinking that way. Two minutes. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I've, I've gone to the gym knowing I just didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. 
and I've snuck in there with the idea in my mind that I'm just going to come in and stretch out, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then about an hour and a half, I leave with every muscle in my body burning because <laughs> once you get there, once you start doing it, you, you've got that commitment. You're there. Right. You might as well do it. And, and then you can start thinking, tomorrow I'll just stretch out. <laughs> <laughs> and then it becomes a habit, yeah, just a, yeah. a simple, simple, easy. Simple habit, yeah. And Love it doesn't take that long to develop habits. It, I mean, it, they say it takes anywhere from 7 to 14 days. <laughs> so if you have bad habits, uh, what you want to do is replace, the, identify those, and then replace them with good habits. If you're sitting on the couch all day, eating fried chicken or something, mm -hmm. And, and and you want to you you want to run a race? You want to do a marathon mm -hmm. or 5K or something? You know you have to get up and go do it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so as you develop a new habit, you're automatically getting rid of the bad habit because you know if you sit there and eat that chicken again, mm -hmm. it's going to hit you in the gut when you're out trying to run. And then uh, you become a zombie. Then you become a zombie. That's right. <laughs> Well, tell us some more about zombies. Are there zombies in our life? And if there are, how do we Id identify them? There are a number of zombies, and I identify them in the book. There are walkers, there are crawlers, there are all types of zombies. And some people are infected and they don't even know it. So when you're talking about zombies, do they look like walking dead zombies, like pieces of their face are falling apart? or? or <laughs> they look like people at the mall. And, and they look like people at Fred Meyer's. No, but you know, I've had people say, gosh, I went to the store and everybody's just looking at their cell phone. They, they seem dead or something. But uh, the zombie obviously is a metaphor for anything bad in your life. Okay. You know, if you're lacking uh, any kind of desire that you might have not wanted to to lose, mm -hmm. if you're lacking that, that could be an infection from a zombie. And and people can be infected, not know it, and they can rub that off on you. So is that just being around people who are zombie-ish and, and um, picking up on their habits, or how else are... You, you know, I, I have read just tons of self-help inspirational books throughout mm -hmm. the year from all the greats and all of them say the same thing that what happens when you try to correct yourself you may have to lose a bunch of your friends mm -hmm. because they want you in that same comfortable space that they know you in they don't want you outside of that space so uh, so you once you identify it then you can make the decision, how much time do I want to spend with that zombie? Maybe, uh, maybe you might want to cut the hours down because it will infect you. It will. So what I hear is as you change, other people change the way they relate to you. And if you find that you're changing and losing some friends, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It might actually be a good thing. Is that right? Yeah, it, it, it always is a good thing, I would say. Because if it, your, your friends have two choices when you're changing. They have a choice to root you on, good job, I want to see you succeed, mm -hmm. or I liked you better when you did this. So <laughs> which one is a true friend, mm -hmm. the one that roots you on, like that one that wants to see you succeed? And why wouldn't your friend want you to succeed in anything you do? That's the kind of friends you need. Exactly. Right. One of the things I love about your book is that you have action plans. And I, I like pragmatic, I like steps. Can you tell us about some of your action plans? Yes, I wanted this book to be a book that you don't read and throw on the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. This book, I wanted it to set up on your, by your desk, your computer, something that uh, there's three or four different action plans throughout the book mm -hmm. so that you are participating with the book mm -hmm. because you're identifying what changes you want to do and one of the, the most important things I've ever found when changing mm -hmm. anything is to put it on paper. And there's been a lot of studies on this. People who write their goals out on paper tend to get there a lot better than people who just keep it in their mind because that's like a dream. But on paper, it becomes a goal, and then a goal always has a deadline. So this book has the action plan, so it ties it all together. I love that. And I know that some people like to type things out. I know I like to actually do the physical writing, but that's my, yeah. my generation, I suppose. <laughs> it is easier to type, especially <laughs> if you have autocorrect. Yes, autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think I'm forgetting how to write, but 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 that puts it in the book, and then you can always look at it. So uh, you might want to write your goals on a, some other kind of diary or something like that. So. One of the stories you have in your book is uh, as you have decapitated your zombie, you started changing the way that you behaved with your employees. And you have a story about Jimmy. Can you give us in a nutshell what that's like? Yeah, in a nutshell, Jimmy was a young kid that came from a very rough life, mm -hmm. living on the streets mm -hmm. of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine kind of adopted him from the age of 16 to 18, but uh, he had a bad life. And when he turned 18, he was turned over to me. Mm -hmm. and. I had a, uh, the sales company, and I trained him in sales. Everybody fell in love with him. He was a wonderful kid, a lot of talent, and he became one of the best salespeople for about three years. And then what happened? Real quick. Then the zombies got him. Oh, no. Yeah, and he went downhill. And how did you get him out of zombie land? <clears throat> you know, it's like Humpty Dumpty. You can't put somebody back together again. Right. But, uh, it was really interesting because we tried everything, right. nothing worked. Uh, I actually planted, I actually narrated this into a camera. I hid across from his apartment in the bushes with my camera knowing that he'd come out at a certain time yep. to go to our meeting. Yep. And I took five $100 bills and crumpled them up on his porch. When he came out and saw the crumpled bills and started unfolding them, he went crazy. This is his lucky day. And that's great. And I think our reader or our watchers should read the book so they can find out how he really turned around. Yeah. When he showed up at the meeting, yeah. he was all gung ho. I love it. Yeah. Uh, he, and that changed his whole, he was, uh, had gone all the way downhill. And that day he said, this is my lucky day. Mm -hmm. And he changed, changed quantumly. He changed that day. Now the $500 seems like a lot of money and you don't have to do that. But Jimmy worked for our company and made our company a lot of money. That's so, great. Yeah. You're such an inspiration. And before, before we wrap up here in just a second, I want to have you say a little bit about your Facebook page, yeah. just like two seconds. Okay, I have a, I, on Facebook, I have the Warrior of Inspiration. Yes. And that page, every single day, five days a week, yep. I write an inspirational quote. Uh -huh. And I marry it to a beautiful poster, picture, yep. photograph something and I put it on there so if you're if you like the page you'll get that little motivation well this has been fantastic I'm so glad you're here thank you everybody for watching our segment and uh, kill your inner zombies